Welcome to this uh, public lecture. So before we start the lecture, uh, I wanted to give a short introduction about our center in Sao Paulo. So it's called the ICTP South American Institute for Fundamental Research. It's a partner institute of ICTP and Trieste. And the mission of the center is to be one of the leading theoretical physics institutes. So we do research, training, and outreach. So of course, this is an outreach activity. So I want to say a little bit about uh, what we do. So ICTP is, of course, in Trieste. That's its number one. And we are here in Sao Paulo in South America. But we have many uh, links with other theoretical physics institutes all over the world, with Perimeter Institute, with the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Here's KITP in Santa Barbara. Many institutes in Europe. We started our center in 2012. And we are obviously growing quickly. Um, we've had over 7,000 visitors, uh, so graduate students and um, professors and postdocs, and we have all kinds of activities. Most of our activities are, are um, activities for PhD students. We have two-week schools. We also, of course, have outreach activities like the one we're doing here. So we have outreach activities for the general audience, public lectures, similar to the one that you're attending now. We also have activities in a museum. It's called the Instituto Moreira Salis. We also have uh, activities in a bar where people uh, can eat and drink and listen to physics. For high school students, we have uh, every Saturday, we have mini courses. So of course, now they're all online. But uh, we also have visits to public schools by our professors. For high school teachers, we also have a special program. Uh, we have translated all of the resources of Perimeter Institute for high school teachers into Portuguese, and we just finished translating it into Spanish with the help of the American Physical Society. And we organize workshops teaching teachers how to use this material in the classroom. So this, it was started by Perimeter Institute. This is the director of the program, Greg Dick, and we have regular activities on this. So of course, since the pandemic, all our activities are online. We have all kinds of activities, schools online, we also have public lectures online, activities for high school students and high school teachers online. And of course, this week and next week, we're organizing Strings 2021. So that's a huge activity. And this is one of the outreach activities associated. So a future activity we will have um, is we've just finished the translation to Spanish of the perimeter uh, material. And now we have, we're trying to build a network over all of Latin America where this material can be taught in the classroom. So um, this is partly funded by the American Physical Society, by an award we won. Okay, so uh, here are just some links to our webpage, Twitter, et cetera, and our sponsors. So let me now stop share screen and give a short introduction of our speaker today. Uh, so um, Professor Sylvester James Gates, so he was born in 1950. He uh, got his bachelor's degree in both math and physics at MIT and also his PhD in MIT, postdocs at Harvard and Caltech. He was a professor from the at the University of Maryland from 1984 to 2017. And since 2017, he's been the director of the Brown Theoret Theoretical Physics Center in Providence. He's won various awards. So in 2011, he won the National Medal of Science, which is the highest award to, to US scientists. In 2014, from the Harvard Foundation, he was uh, nominated Scientist of the Year, and he's the current president of the American Physical Society. So these are some of the awards, but actually I have a close personal connection with Jim. Uh, when I was a graduate student, I was working on things that closely related to what he worked out called uh, supersymmetry and superspace, which is something he's going to talk about. And I think if I had to choose one word to describe Jim, it would be a pioneer. So a pioneer is somebody who's obviously has to be ahead of his time, and somebody who's willing to take risks and explore new territory that hasn't been explored yet. So uh, his work on supersymmetry and superspace was done in 1984, which is uh, well before most of the people entered the field. It was a group of young physicists that did this work. And soon after that, I, when I was a graduate student, I met him as a graduate student. He I actually visited him in his house. I don't remember if he remembers. And actually, some of his later work, I'm still trying to understand and to work on. He has a really nice paper on something called ectoplasm that has become um, a part of my work. And uh, of course, aside from this pioneering work in research, he's also been a pioneer for other minority students in physics. So 
Um, in addition uh, to, to his work at, on the American Physical Society, which has, for example, a bridge program for minority students, he's been the chair of the physics department of Howard University, which is the premier research institute uh, for Afri primarily for African-American students. He was the past president of the National Society of Black Physicists. And uh, so, so he's really a pioneer. And also in 2013, he was the first African-American theoretical physicist to be elected to the National Academy of Sciences. So obviously he's a pioneer in that aspect also. So before uh, we start the lecture, let me just remind you that tomorrow we also have an activity at the same time called Ask the String Theorists which is going to be moderated by Nobel Prize winner David Gross and is going to involve questions sent by YouTube chat to all the speakers of our strings meeting. Okay, so today, just to remind you, uh, uh, Professor Gates is going to give a lecture, six, approximately 60 minutes, and then we're going to have 30 minutes of questions, which you can send by chat. So you can send them either by in, in English or Portuguese. We'll of course translate the questions sent in Portuguese into English, and then we'll ask them to Jim so the questions can be up to 200 characters just because of the limit of YouTube chat. But you can send the questions already during the talk. Don't wait until the end, because obviously the chat period, the question period is only 30 minutes. So um, try, to, try to send questions early so that we can have time to select them and ask them. OK, so it's a pleasure to, to now have Jim uh, share screen and, and start his talk. Well, first of all, Nathan, thank you for that kind of introduction. Um, I don't, you know, I never thought of myself as a pioneer. I just think of myself as someone who wanders off the beaten track looking at interesting mathematics. I often tell people that I'm a mathematical ditch digger because I like to get into very intricate mathematics, but not mathematics for mathematics sake, but for mathematics and in service of better understanding of theoretical physics. So today I'm gonna to talk, uh, my title is how to describe quantum gravity particles in physics from a starship. So uh, let me just uh, start with a farcical story. Uh, imagine that there was uh, the world's greatest physicist who shall remain unknown for this audience, but many people know who I'm talking about. And that person was working on M theory and made a mistake. And there might've been some aliens, you know, the government just, re leads a report on UFOs uh, the last couple of days here in the US. And suppose these aliens were actually in a starship traveling by watching this mistake. They might want to be helpful and correct the error, but in order to do that, they have to be able to uh, communicate with our earthbound physicists and in particular knowledge of both quantum theory as well as general relativity are required and so that's the question that I'm actually after today. And I hope by the end of this talk to have uh, lent some insight to my audience about uh, the relevance of that story to the actual work of our talk. So let me begin with some quotes. Uh, the, I tell people all the time, Albert Einstein is my hero, Maximus. Uh, so one of his quotes is, imagination is more important than knowledge. For knowledge is limited to all we now know and understand while imagination embraces the entire world and all there will be to know and understand. That's a very important fact about the way theoretical physics works. Alan Turing commented about imagination in a different way. Sometimes it is the people no one can imagine anything of who do the things no one can imagine. And then finally, Paul Dirac, not commenting about imagination, but also a quote I, that I hold very dear, living it's worthwhile if one can contribute in some small way to the endless uh, challenge of progress. So we're gonna start with uh, Einstein, Einstein's equations and visualization. However, I am very mindful that my audience is not just physicists. So in fact, what we're going to do is to heavily, uh, heavily use in our presentation, the ideas behind the equations, the visualization behind the and that's why visualization is so important to us. This is my favorite uh, image of Albert Einstein from uh, 1999, Time Magazine. He was named the Man of the Century. And this is uh, one of my favorite pieces of classical music. This is Rachmaninoff's second. And I tell people who are not physicists, I bet you are not frightened when you see something like that. So please, what, 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 why is that? Well, because you know that all of this may look complicated on paper, 
uh, if you could hear it played, it might be a very pleasant experience. So during my talk, we are going to be playing Albert Einstein's equations. Uh, this is Albert Einstein's first equation, set of equations from 1905. This is special relativity. The fact that when you move fast and observe the universe around you, strange things appear to happen. Uh, distant um, measurements of length can be shortened, time can slow down, and effects of that nature, mass increases. And so these are the equations upon which uh, that is all, all uh, a consequence. However, as I told you, we're not about equations in this talk. We're going to use visualization. And so there's this very nice uh, visualization I found on YouTube a number of years ago. And anyone who's looking for it, you can see the uh, link at the bottom of this transparency. Newton thought of space as a fixed grid. Those are the green lines that we see in this diagram. Uh, in this grid, you see there's some yellow lines, but those are the paths by which a light beam would travel if you turned it on. So according to Newton, the rigid green, the rigid grid that never changes, but according to Einstein, in fact, it's not rigid at all. In fact, the grid is flexible. And so objects can shrink in space. Uh, durations of time, moving slot clocks run slower. And as I said earlier, man, mass increases. Also, the idea of what happens simultaneously is broken. And the only thing that's constant in this view of Einstein is the speed of light, which is represented by the slope of the yellow line in these diagrams. So we're now going to Einstein's second great contribution. This second contribution was made in 1916 and 1915 when he completed what we now call the Einstein field equation. Again, I asked my audience who were not te technically, uh, uh, technically involved to forgive me for showing you the score, but I think it's important that you see the score. What does the score actually imply? Well, Einstein's field equations give us a solution to a problem that even stunned and stymied Sir Isaac Newton, namely, it explains how gravity works. Basically, it says that space and time are like a fabric. And in fact, when you have a massive object like the sun, it creates a dent in that fabric, or the earth creates a smaller dent. And these dents are what, uh, are what we associate with gravity. Uh, a few years ago, in fact, two years ago, I, I completed a book about uh, Einstein together with a co-author, Kathy Pelletier. And I, I wanted to use this occasion to speak a little bit about this book because it explains how Einstein's work came to the entire world. It's also related to Brazil, which is a place of our, uh, one of our, our, host, our host institution. And so I encourage anyone who under, wants to understand the entire story, not just the 1919 part of this book. Uh, you can acquire this book. And, we, and then I have to tell you, the book is not about the science. It is about the scientists. Because many people who are not scientists have a, a view of scientists that basically says we're aliens. And the book is to break that down. I wanted to discuss the lives of these people. Uh, in 1919, there was an eclipse that was observed in Sobral, uh, Brazil. And that eclipse confirmed that Einstein's view of gravitation actually is in accord with observation. And so the uh, book actually highlights far more people than Albert Einstein. So it has a very interesting uh, cast of characters. So what are some of the legacies of this view? Well, here's the, I think the one that is the most important. Namely, with the general theory of relativity, uh, one can understand how the universe comes into existence in a scientific manner. This was done uh, by, not by Einstein himself, by the way. The idea of the Big Bang which was called the primeval A initially by its creator, um, indicates, is indicated in this diagram by this point of light here. So something happened that started our universe off about 13.7 uh, billion years ago. And the person who first conceived of this was Georges Lemaitre, an August, a Belgian Augustine monk, who was also a very accomplished physicist. Um, in fact, Einstein's equations actually describe five possibilities for the creation of the universe, and I'm showing them here. You'll notice I've highlighted this object I call lambda. Uh, that object is the cosmological constant. And if lambda is equal to zero in Einstein's equations, then the universe can come into existence 
and expand forever if more gravity was in matter than gravity, more energy was in gravity over matter at the point of creation. But if more energy was in gravity than matter when the Big Bang happened, the universe would eventually collapse. You can, this constant lambda can be greater than zero. If it's strictly greater than zero, then the universe, in fact, not only expands, but accelerates in its expansion. And in fact, about 20 years ago, uh, we were astounded in the physics community to find out that this appears to be the kind of universe we live in. Uh, we uh, are, are in an accelerated universe. We often ascribe this to dark energy. And dark energy, in, at least in the simplest interpretation, is associated with the cosmological constant. If the constant is negative, well, you can, set, you can make, think of the universe as a fixed bubble in space and time. And in fact, that's why Einstein introduced the cosmological constant, because all the world's greatest astronomers and physicists, uh, cosmologists around him will say, oh, the universe is static and eternal. So he put this equation, this term in the equation to accomplish that, because without it, you can't get solutions that are static and eternal. A few years later, uh, Edwin Hubble, among others, pointed out that the universe is actually expanding. And so at that point, Einstein erased the cosmological constant from his equation and called it the biggest blunder of his career. And he was sort of right, because if he had stuck by his guns and not introduced it, he would have predicted the expansion of the universe and perhaps been the recipient of a second Nobel Prize. In order to reach our goals, we can't just talk about cosmology. We have to talk about fundamental particle physics and in particular the standard model. Uh, I like to show this image to people because this is what the standard model tells us are the basic ingredients for creating uh, in the lower quadrant, we have uh, uh, objects like the electron, the muon, which is a kind of a copy of the electron, but 200 times as heavy, and the tau particle, another copy of the electron that's 1,700 times as heavy. Uh, so this column is all about the electrons. The part of the diagram here illustrates the quarks, the up, down, charm, strange, uh, top, and beautiful quarks. And so these are the constituents of the grid matter. However, if a universe only consisted of these objects, we wouldn't be here because you need forces to cause these objects to cohere into long sta uh, into stable structures. And so that is provided by a set of force carriers, the most familiar of which is the photon, the carrier of electromagnetic force. Um, when about the time that I was a graduate student, uh, work was done on the weak interaction model. And the model that survived is called the glashell weinberg salon model. That model tells us that there's another force carrier in nature called the Z0. It's the carrier of the weak nuclear force. And there are two carriers of the weak nuclear force that are electrically charged. For the uh, gluons, there, and there are eight of them, uh, they are responsible for confining the quarks to the interior of matter. And then finally, in 2012, uh, the first observations of the Higgs boson was made. Uh, all of these particles in the span of one. Yes. Jim, could you please speak a little bit louder just for the translator to be able to hear you? Better. I'm sorry. I will certainly, uh, I'm bringing the microphone a little bit closer. I hope that's better. Yeah. Uh, the particles in the standard model all spin at a rate, which is governed by a quantity, which we can denote as J. Um, this quantity takes on values of either zero, one half, one for the particles of the standard model. Uh, all the our particles of, with J equal one half are the quarks and leptons. The bosons or force carriers either have zero to one, with the Higgs being the only one carrying the value zero. So when people talk about elementary particles, you ought to think about little spinning balls as a picture in your mind. Now, it turns out that the spin of the electron acts like a small magnet, but it's a magnet that has a very interesting property. I, I want, I'm showing you two balls here. And what I want you to imagine is that there's an electron in the center of these spheres. What I'm showing you with these arrows are the directions, and oh, also the balls are actually moving upward uh, as you view them. And so what I'm showing you with the arrows are the directions in which this magnetic property of the electron can point. You'll notice that it can't point in all directions. It's confined to what you might call a circle of latitude um, on this uh, sphere. And it can either be up or it can be down, that spin up, spin down that we learn about in chemistry. However, the fact that the electrons have this property of spin is extraordinarily important. And we are actually on the verge of creating a new technology called quantum computing. Uh, companies like Google 
<coughs> other uh, IC, IBM and other na national and international competitors are using the fact that the spin of the electron together with quantum mechanics implies that you can form what's called a qubit. And the qubit, if we can, if we can perfect this technology, will lead to computers that are far, far more powerful than what we have now. How moving particles of the standard model wiggle? I bet you didn't know that they wiggle, so let me try to take you through that story. Uh, he here's how the, how the Higgs boson wiggles. Namely, in this picture, you are, I want you to imagine there's a Higgs boson that is moving left and right. And you'll notice that what I've actually got here is a slinking, as an illustration again that I took from the uh, YouTube. And you'll see that as it's moving, you get these cl this clumping section of the slinking. Well, it turns out that if you write the equations for this clumping, it is in fact, it's uh, a very close kin to the equation for the Higgs boson. And so that's how the Higgs boson wiggles when it moves. The photon, on the other hand, wiggles in an entirely different way. Uh, here's another uh, computer uh, graphic illustration. Uh, here we have a wave that to the back of these plates is going up and down. We call that linear polarization. But this is a quarter wave plate. And so we can use the plate to break out two pieces of the wiggling of the photon. Namely, that we can have what's called left-handed or right-handed polarization. Now let the cartoon run one more time so you can compare the difference between these two things. You'll notice that the photon winds around, that if you think of it as a clock face, it uh, winds around uh, counterclockwise and clockwise with these two. However, uh, Maxwell and Faraday thought about photons in a rather interesting way, and I have an illustration I'd like to show you about that. Uh, Faraday, in particular, I made, is uh, reported to have made the quote that light is nothing but a hopscotch game between electric and magnetic fields. So, what was he referring to? Well, here's a computer uh, animation for this concept. You'll see that there are two kinds of figures. There are what you might call stars and there are rings. Well, these represent the electric and magnetic field. The uh, electrical field are the stars because the electrical field uh, actually acts radially from, uh, um, radially outward uh, from a line of charge. On the other hand, a magnetic field is actually wrapped all around a moving line of charge. And so those are the circles. And so indeed, Photons. Sir, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can you speak just a, a hair louder? This is a translator speaking. It's okay. A little tough. Me, okay. okay. Sorry about that. Let me try to keep my voice up. Yes, please uh, do. Thank you. Okay. So as I was saying, Faraday had this idea about the hopscotch game with the stars here representing the electrical field and the circles representing the magnetic fields. Gravitons wave, wiggle. So if you had a graviton wave, and in fact, we're able to measure them because of the LIGO experiment, a linearly polarized graviton wave does the following. You see there's a red circle in this diagram? Imagine that's a tunnel and there's a graviton wave coming at you from the rear of the tunnel towards you. As you can see, it deforms the tunnel and it's these deformations that LIGO actually measure to, de to detect them. But this is linear polarization. What about helicity? states. Here we're looking at what happens to the walls of this circular tunnel as a positive helicity graviton comes from the back of the tunnel to the front of us. As you can see, the, the deformation is much more complicated, but you can also see that it has a winding sense. That green line tells you it's winding around. The, there's another state of polarization, just like with the photon. And so here we see the opposite, the negative helicity graviton. Okay, so this is what I mean by wiggling, namely that if you look at a proper, any particle of the standard model, oh, and I should probably tell you about a particle that doesn't belong to the standard model. Namely, we talked about the electron, but mathematically, we know how to describe particles that have the parameter J equal to three halves. And once again, I ask you to imagine that at the center, very center of these spheres, there's such a particle. And then we're asking the question, uh, if there's an analog of the magnetic property, what directions can it point in? And the answer is there are four latitudes that it can move and it point towards as the, uh, as the uh, three hash particle moves vertically in each of these diagrams. So we've covered a lot of physics. We've covered some relativity. We've covered particle physics. We need a few more elements for our discussion. 
And so that means move on to the property of supersymmetry and make a reference to Mark 1. You'll remember earlier, I showed you the particles of the standard model and this in this table, in this tabular form. Um, I often ask people, um, does this look pretty to you? And usually people say, no, it's kind of out of balance. And that's exactly right, because humans are coded to, uh, to, uh, to, to, very, to a very high degree to be sensitive to symmetries. And so um, you look at this and say, well, this, this is obviously not balanced. So next I uh, will do this. I ask, well, what about this picture? And most people say, yes, that's a much more balanced picture. Well, you see, what I just showed you is what happens if you think that these minimum, the particles of the minimal of the standard model are accompanied by other particles called super partners that we have not yet the technology to see. Remember, we can't see perfectly. And in fact, the Higgs boson wasn't seen until 2012, even though it was predicted about 40 years earlier. So there might be these other particles out there. We need advanced technology to see them. And if this particular pattern occurs, it tells us that for every particle of matter, so here's an electron, there is a, a particle that, there's a particle that is very similar to the electron called the selectron. For the photon, which is a particle that carries the electromagnetic energy, there is a particle over here called the selectron, which also is a carrier of electromagnetic energy, but this has J equal to one, where this has J equal to half. These all have J equal to half. Everything over here has J equal to zero. So you see, as you move across the vertical red lines, you change the value of J by a half. So this is the minimal supersymmetric model. People often ask me, why, why do theoretical physicists still talk about this? Isn't it dead yet? So I'd like to point out to people that no, it's not. The reason that uh, the press and many people who discuss these matters think it's dead is because before the LAC was uh, active, uh, there were lots and lots of predictions that you would be able to see these extra particles that I showed you in my table. Not all of us believe that. And in fact, in 2006, I actually explicitly said in an article called Is String Theory Phenomenologically Viable? That even if nature was kind enough to provide a light superpartner, it might take as long as a century to pass before it was directly observed. Now, this was not, this was a very much a minority view, but it happened to turn out to be right. So, uh, uh, more recently, I've said that supersymmetry, I strongly believe, will in the end be figuratively like Mark Twain, who is often misquoted as having said, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. And that's the reason why supersymmetry is still a viable option to study for theoretical physicists. Because what has happened is that we've simply discarded a class of models. But supersymmetry is not a model. It's a, it's a platform for constructing models. What about Sir Isaac Newton versus Albert Einstein? Well, not Albert Einstein, but Albert Einstein's bet noir. So many people know that Albert Einstein was never, never satisfied with the concept of quantum theory. And yet he made an important contribution that got the ball rolling. So one way to think about the difference between classical and quantum theory is that in a classical theory, if you have a particle moving along and nothing affects it, it travels in a nice straight line at a constant speed. So that's what we call the classical path. On the other hand, if you're thinking about something quantum mechanically going from one point to another, the same uh, beginning point and end points are along the classical path, the particle can travel in all kinds of strange ways. And I've only illustrated one here. And so quantum mechanics says the universe is complicated and that you can't actually know what the particle is doing unless you are observing it. So here's the classical path, nice and simple, Newton's second law. And Newton's second law, uh, when we go into the realm of quantum mechanics, also implies something about the forces. So this is a diagram called a Feynman diagram. And let me set it into motion. This is their two white dots. Uh, there was a flash in the middle. This is a, uh, a pictorial way of explaining how the force of electromagnetic repulsion comes in. One electron on the left emits a photon towards the direction of the right. The photon on the, uh, it gets the location of the electron left and tells it you ought to move away. And so this Feynman diagram captures the story of how electromagnetic forces work. And in fact, if you use Richard Feynman's rules for this diagram, you can derive that the force law 
goes like one over r squared. What about the quantum mechanics? Well, remember, if we talked about moving particles, we said, well, gee, things can move in compli complicated paths. So what does that uh, imply about the forces? Well, here's a diagram, very similar to our original one. But in this diagram, uh, let me use my cursor. You can see we have one electron that will travel on the left-hand side, a second electron that will travel right. Um, this first electron will emit a photon, which it later absorbs. However, it emits a second photon, and it's that second photon that tells the second electron to move away. Let's watch the cartoon. So if you actually take Mr. Feynman's rules and calculate the mathematics associated with this force of repulsion, you will find it is not strictly the one over R squared law that you're taught in high school. It's actually more complicated. Well, it doesn't stop with just this one diagram. Here's another diagram. What happens here? Well, our first electron emits a photon at this point. That photon travels to space and time and then disassociates itself into an electron and the, uh, the electron's antiparticle, the positron. Since these two have uh, opposite charges, they attract each other and they get back together, destroying each other, creating a second photon. And then it's the second photon that actually tells the second electron uh, to move away from itself. The first process I showed you was, is called a vertex correction. This process is called vacuum polarization. And we have put measurements that prove these things actually apply to our world. In fact, the most precise measurement of anything in science is about measuring these Feynman diagrams. I told you the electron had a magnetic like bar-like property. Uh, its strength is measured in something called G or G value. So about a decade ago, we can measure G and it is this upper number uh, from these Feynman di diagrams. And it's not just two, you have to take hundreds of them to make these calculations with precision. Uh, we found this number. And if you'll notice, the only difference between these two numbers is in the last two digits. And so that it, to that precision, we could say the universe is quantum mechanical. However, today the measured value has gone well beyond that. And so what I like to tell people is that quantum mechanics, we physicists have observations that support the belief to better than one part in a billion that our universe is governed by the laws of quantum theory, not by the classical laws of Newton. And so this is why we are completely comfortable until nature tells us something different. And in fact, this has been in the news recently. Uh, there, the muon also has a G minus two value, which has been measured. And there's some evidence that maybe some new particles are out there. Are they the super partners? We don't know. But there's, as, as long as we continue to accumulate this evidence, this will allow us a, a doorway to look. I'm next going to follow two giants of physics, Paul Dirac and Richard Feynman. Uh, and we're going to do this uh, because we're interested in a quantum theory of gravity. In some sense, this is a holy grail for our field. A lot of work in string theory pushed us along this direction. Uh, we're going to go to something slightly larger in string theory. And here are pictures of uh, Dirac and Feynman. Dirac uh, also commented that if you're humble and receptive, mathematics will lead you by the hand. Whereas Feynman uh, said, well, physics is not the most important thing, but love is. And I had the great pleasure of being a, a postdoc in Richard Feynman's research group from 1980 to 1982. So I actually uh, met Mr., uh, Dr. Feynman and I have Feynman stories I've never written. Perhaps one day I will. So the direct Feynman view of quantum mechanics leads to this beautiful idea called the sum over histories. How does it work? Well, here I have a starting point and an ending point. And classically, we know that a particle would just go in a straight line between the two. But quantum mechanics is that you can assign all kinds of ways to get there. But what you need to do is to know the probability of all these ways. Feynman actually gave an operational definition for how to calculate these probabilities. So with that in mind, I'm gonna to jump to 1995 when our colleague Edward Witten proposed that string theory actually could be unified with something that had been caught on the side called the 11 dimensional supergravity theory. 
uh, Edward's suggestion was that all of these things are part of a master theory that we should be studying. So level dimensional supergravity, well, uh, this symbol here stands for the graviton. This is a, one of those spin three hash particles that I showed you that had four latitudes and how their uh, spin vector could point. And this object is called a three form. It's kind of like a photon, but not quite. So this theory was proposed uh, by Kremer, Julia, and Bernard, uh, Kremer, I'm sorry, Kremer and Julia. And one of the things that you can do is ask, is it supersymmetric? Well, the answer is yes or no, depending on how you count. You see, if you count classically, mainly following the classical pass of motion of this, what you find is that for the fermion, there are 128 degrees of freedom. But for the sum of the two bosons, there's also 128 degrees of freedom. You say, aha, that reminds me of the balance of supersymmetry. On the other hand, so we're good there. On the other hand, if you do quantum mechanics, you're not allowed just to talk about what happens on the classical path. You have to consider quantum paths, those strange wiggly paths. And when you do that, that brings in more degrees of freedom. And consequently, the degrees of freedom are not balanced. And so you don't actually have supersymmetry if you're in a fully quantum regime. Uh, we're going to use a trick because I remember I keep trying to avoid mathematics. And so one of the ways to talk over these objects is actually draw pictures. And so a set of pictures uh, on this diagram are young to blows. This is a mathematical technique that's been known for at least a, what, almost a century. And we physicists use it to talk about different uh, quarks, for example, but it can also be applied more generally. So I'm gonna apply it in the rest of my talk. Uh, 1973, uh, uh, looking at this problem about the mismatch of degrees between bosons and fermions, not in 11 dimensions, but in four, because the problem's easier in four, it was noticed that if you construct uh, the analog of supergravity in four dimensions, that there are two degrees of freedom for the, for, the, uh, for the boson and two degrees of freedom for the fermion. And so you have equality. But if you do quantum mechanical counting, there's actually 12 here, and six over here, they're not equal. So you have the same problem. So uh, the theory of supergravity itself, which uh, was really first initially talked about uh, without thinking about the quantum mechanical weirdness, uh, in 76, uh, two groups of, uh, of researchers uh, actually proposed this theory. Uh, in 1977, Bright, uh, a physicist named Peter Brighton solved the problem about having this equal numbers, right? The left-right symmetry of my table applied to the supergravity theory. The solution is you add more uh, fields or in, in terms of pictures, you add more uh, wigglers. And so with his approach, which was finally brought to full fruition in 77 and 78 by, as I said, Peter Brighton on the first, uh, Ferrara van Nievenhuizen, uh, Stella West, we found a theory where the numbers of degrees of freedom are the same. But what about M theory and 11 inch supergravity? This is a problem that has been around since around 1995 or so. It's almost a 40 year old problem. Most of our community has not dealt with this problem, but some of us continue to worry about these unsolved problems, and I'm one of them. So when you have a problem that's been around that long, and some of the most intelligent, hardworking people in the world have worked on it and not found a solution, that suggests that you need to think about the problem in an entirely different way. And so while I'm aware of these problems, I'm also aware of many other parts of science. And so I use those as perhaps ways to solve the problem. So let's look at some other things in science. Uh, so I have a lot of motivation for this. This slide actually comes from a presentation that two of my students gave uh, during the, the Gong Show, which happened on Wednesday. Uh, Hazel Ma and Yangri Yu, who we're going to meet in terms of research shortly, because they were my collaborators in solving this problem, uh, used this slide to talk about the 40-year drought between knowing uh, the initial construction of supergravity, and then knowing how to make 11, the 11 dimensional version consistent with the laws of off-shell quantum mechanics. So what are the parts of science uh, are out there? Well, there's lots. And so let me start by actually looking at the Wikipedia itself. So this is a diagram that you can find online. And what it shows is uh, the contribute. So the E in the middle is uh, con uh, contributions to the English language version of the Wikipedia. Uh, 
these various spheres that you see are, uh, are, contrib are contributing from editors that speak other languages. In sociology, we also see these sorts of things. And uh, in gen genetics, we do. So graph theory, it turns out, is the mathematics that lies behind these, uh, these sorts of ideas. And so as long as uh, a decade ago, I had a suspicion that graph theory would help me solve this problem. It began uh, in 2004 with a colleague named Michael Fox. Uh, as you can see, here's a picture of the sun. Um, this dot is supposed to represent the 11 dimensional supergravity that uh, Witten unified with the five strings. And our idea was, imagine that there was something like the sun that shines on the apex of a, of a pyramid and projects down into a much simpler mathematical guise, but carries the information along with it. It's kind of a it's kind of like a holography. And so in 2004, we proposed that this idea must work. And the way to implement it is to use an idea that comes from Albert Einstein. Um, Albert Einstein tells us that the way physics works is if you're at a certain point and you're an observer, anything that could be communicated to you by a signal that travels slower than the speed of light or the speed of light can affect you. And that you can only affect the future within by sending signals that again, either travel slower than the speed of light or the speed of light. So our idea was when you try to do physics, we're really trying to make predictions in the entirety of this forward light cone. But let's drop that problem and try to make predictions only along a single line. And we might as well take this line to be the time axis by using the Lorentz transformation of Einstein's. So the equations that you use to study the balance look like this. Remember, we can't avoid equations entirely, so these are our scores. But when you do this projection process, you can turn them into graphs. And not only can you turn them into graphs, these graphs retain information about the systems of equations that gave rise to them. You can play with these graphs. It turns out that you can turn one graph into another. There was a very simple transformation. And that transformation, interestingly enough, is the relationship between the two sets of equations I showed you a couple of transparencies back. These graphs come in different varieties, as you might imagine, because they're different sets of particles. And so here's a more complicated graph that we found is associated with, the, uh, with what's called the prepotential of electromagnetism. These graphs can be folded and they fold because they have bits inside of them, computer bits, ones and zeros. This was a shocking result that a group of my collaborators and I found. And uh, what was interesting is it took us three years to publish this, I think partly because it was so weird. But these bits that are inside of these graphs actually control how you fold them down. Uh, our, we named these graphs, we gave these graphs a name, we called them adinkras. And in 2010, Physics World uh, made our work the subject of its cover story uh, for one of its editions. So this is the cover. You can, Actually, if you're interested in this, I recommend you go back and get this copy and read it because we gave a, a very non-mathematical description of what these projections are. Observations. It turns out that error correcting codes choose what foldings are allowed in these diagrams. This was the result that took us three years to publish in the physics literature. The other thing that's interesting is the shapes of these diagrams when they're folded are encoded in eigenvalues, a concept that is well known to people who use matrices. This, the net upshot of this mathematics is that we can sequence the equations just like you can sequence, sequence uh, genomes. And this is an example of such sequencing. The first, the first line is the sequencing of the equation that is of the of the equation that contains the electron and this electron. Uh, the third line is the sequencing of the equations that can contain the photon and the superpartner, the photino. We found a, a whole raft of deep new mathematics comes out of this point of view. Thing where I talked about error correcting codes, Cox setter groups, Gotenbeek's uh, descent de uh, Bailey pairs, Morse devices, elliptical curves. If you like a lot of rich mathematics, boy, have I got a toy for you. So, that was sort of what we were doing around 2005. But always in the back of the mind, we had these problems like M theory. So in 2019, working with my students, Hazel Mock, 
and Young Gray Hugh, we decided to make a run on this problem. It's a little bit like summiting a mountain. You know, you have to go through various stages and then you have a final dash to the summit. So we made the decision to make the dash to the summit in a series of papers. I'm just showing you the covers. And then I'm gonna talk about the ideas that came out of this. The first idea, the wigglers that I showed you should be described in terms of graphical images. Why? Well, part of the reason is that an enormous, uh, an enormous amount of human intellectual capacity is in our ability to process visual information. So if you can present information in a visual form, you're likely to be able to leverage that innate ability to think about mathematical problems if the visual forms capture the essence of the mathematical problems. Uh, those kinds of pictures that I just showed you are called young tableaus, and they're a well-established part of mathematical literature. Again, for people who are mathematically minded, you can just go to the Wikipedia to learn about these things. We had to invent some new sorts of uh, young tableaus. And in fact, we have red young tableaus and you, blue young tableaus. That should remind you of that table where we had bosons and fermions. Well, the bosons in our uh, graphical picture are represented by these blue objects. The fermions, the things that obey the Pauli exclusion principle, are represented by the red boxes. And so we need both of them because supersymmetry says you have to have equal numbers of these things. Um, we realize that the superfields, uh, which is an idea that uh, I can expand upon later, that was introduced um, by Abdus Salam and, and, and uh, John Strafty, uh, are actually determined by the exponentiation of young to blows. That is, take the exponential of these graphical things that that we were introducing. That means that you get some more pictures. And in particular, you can create something that acts like a scan for forensic science. So here's the exponential of a uh, building four dimensional theories. So the exponential is a well defined function. You take the young to blow together with the rules for multiplication that we've discovered, and you find out that in a particular case, it generates this set of pictures. That might not seem astounding to you, except that's a picture of the graviton super multiple. And it comes solely by taking the exponential of these uh, pictures I'm showing you here. So we checked it. So we checked our ideas back against what was done in history. We then went ahead and said, well, let's see if we can do something that hasn't been done. So again, we take a single one of these red boxes, like you, my cursor circling, and you put it in the exponential. And you have to define the multiplication rules, and we have found new multiplications. And you generate this object. This is a 16-unit uh, tall object. It's appropriate for 10 dimensions, but our goal, remember, was 11. Well, 11 presents some problems, folks. In order to use, even to use this graphical method, you turn to use the use of computers. In fact, uh, I, I like to show this picture to young people I, where I tell them that learning to use coding is like putting on the uh, putting on the mathematical version of the Iron Man suit because you get enormous power over the mathematics that you're studying. And then, of course, there's this wonderful tool called Mathematica that uh, we needed because in the case that we were looking at, the graph is actually 16 stories tall and it has billions of nodes. And that's what computers are really good at. So we had to design algorithms that would capture the graph theory and the network structure. Uh, these structures included the boxes, which are technically known as Dinkin, uh, equivalent to Dinkin labels. There's a mathematical process called pythism, that, or rather plethism, that you have to build into the algorithms. Fortunately, some people who study, uh, actually study the physics at the LHC had already developed this kind of mathematics. So we were able to simply borrow, reach out, and in a collaborative fashion, borrow it. And then finally, you need computational power. Remember I told you that the 11 inch problem was huge? It has 2,147,483,648 bosons and 2,147,483,648 fermions. And so the question is, what kinds of wigglers are these? Are they all wigglers like the Higgs boson? Are there some wigglers like the graviton? Are there wigglers like photons? 
This is the problem no one had known a solution to in the 40 year span that this question has been out there. Here's a picture of the diagram of the object that we were able to construct by the same means that we checked against four dimensional supergravity. We checked it in 10 dimensions by showing you that 16 uh, component image. And here we checked it on the full 32 dimension, uh, 32 height object. What we found was kind of interesting. Namely that there are, uh, there are uh, 1,198 bosonic fields. That is feels like the Higgs particle, feels like the photon, feels uh, like the graviton. And there are 1,186 fermions and the gravitino is only one of these fields. So for the first time, we can state the Lorentz representations that are consistent with general relativity on one hand and with the fact that you have to have quantum mechanics saying all, uh, saying that you have to allow for all possibilities, not just counting on the classical equation motion. And then Susie says, aha, the numbers of degrees of wiggling freedom must be the same, but how it gets distributed among the wigglers is different. And that's what we, the problem we explicitly uncovered. You know, we can't actually draw these pictures, folks. You know, <laughs> trying to draw, imagine a diagram that has over 2 billion dots or, and, and many more lines between them uh, is not a doable task, but it is by a computer. So our code grabs completely the graphical technology that we've developed for the subject. And this is how it looks when you start classifying it. In particular, at the 16 level, there's a six, what we call a 65. That's a name for the wiggler associated with the graviton. Uh, there's another wiggler that's similar to the, uh, that you need for scale symmetry. That's the wiggler associated with the Higgs boson, but in 11 dimensions. And then finally, that three form object is this 165. So we can actually use this technology to look at the wigglers at all levels of the superfields. This is equivalent to what's called the theta expansion in more conventional language. Uh, at level uh, 17, there's the 320. And I remind you that 320 was the spin three halves object of M theory. So we have this technology that lets us look inside our superfields without using theta expansions and is built by exponentiation of young to blows. So we've got a lot of unknown results, uh, previously unknown results here. We've classified the wigglers according to the representation of Lorentz theory. Uh, we can see that the graviton and gravitino are at adjacent levels in our diagram and they have to be for supersymmetry. And it's possible that we will find smaller systems, but the only way that we will do that is by following the path that Peter Brighton on a trailblaze in the, in the uh, late 70s, which is the next important step. The challenge, we have to use these uh, graph, these Adinkra graph networks to find the structure of the supergravity gauge group for 11 dimensions. And we think we know how to do that, but it's gonna be obviously some more calculations. Um, one of the interesting uh, problems that I'm working on with some of my collaborators right now is remember I told you that uh, in 2005, 2006, we found that error correcting codes are necessarily part of the graphs that we use. Well, nowadays, of course, many people are talking about quantum error correcting codes. And so the question is, will supersymmetry actually give us a way to construct previously unknown quantum error correcting codes or will they be uh, just in the class of error correcting codes that have already been found? So this is ongoing research that we're engaged in right now. And I and my mathematical and physics colleagues are very excited and we're actively looking at this along with uh, one of my graduate students. I'd like to thank some people and organizations. First of all, I'd like to thank the great courses. Many of the graphical images that I have used for this talk are found in a presentation that I created for them in 2006. It's called Superstring Theory, the DNA of Reality. The graphical images were actually created by Mr. Kenneth Briggs. I have to acknowledge a whole raft of people, including students, other physicists and mathematicians that have been very, very integral to my, uh, my 40 year long journey of thinking about this problem. I have also a graphics artists that have allowed me to be able to explain to you without the mathematics exactly what it is that I am up to and why we think it's, it's, it's progress. And over the lifetime, this research project has been supported by grants from the National Science Foundation, University of Maryland, and currently the Brown University Forward Professorship Endowment. 
I want to thank uh, S.J. Gates III and D.E.A. Gates for technical assistance in the preparation of this file because, uh, you know, I'm 70 years old, folks, so sometimes it's really difficult for an old dog to learn a new trick. And so these two young people help me. They're my kids, obviously. And then finally, this talk is dedicated to the memory of Joseph Phillips. He was an innovative cancer researcher and a former student of mine whose contributions to the foundation of this research are, is of very greatly uh, value. And then finally, I want to thank the organization committee for allowing me to speak to you and the public about one little adventure in the current status of the confines of string theory in the string theory intellectual domain. Thank you. I'll take questions now. Okay, so I'll thank Jim and I'm sure everybody else will thank him in their own way. So uh, we can start with some questions. So some of the questions have been sent by chat in English and Portuguese that I will translate. So one question is from Brito Silva. So the question is, Isaac Newton tackled the same problem as Albert Einstein. What new ideas allowed Einstein to see beyond Newton? So the most important thing for Albert Einstein is to ask the right question. And the question he asked when he was 15 years old, the question was, what would the universe look like if I could ride along on a beam of light? Now that might not seem like a very uh, deep question. Now remember he's 15, so he hasn't gone to university. He doesn't have uh, a university level physics, but it's the right question. And this story is a great illustration about how asking the right question yields important, powerful benefits in finding answers. So why is that the right question? Well, the way he thought of it, one of the ways he thought about it is that if you hold a mirror and you're on a train, how do you see yourself? Well, the answer is light bounces off of you, goes to the mirror, and then goes to your eyes. Now, as the train uh, speeds up, the question is, as the train speeds up, if you follow Newton, you would say that when the train gets the speed of light, the, uh, the speed of light, the light trying to get from your forehead to the mirror never makes it because the mirror is racing away at exactly the same speed and you would disappear. This is what Einstein was able to reason out as a very young teenager. Now, he didn't have the mathematical acumen to do to figure this all out. And so it took him 10 years of going off to the university, getting a PhD and studying Maxwell's equations because Maxwell's equations are the mathematical description of light. And therefore, with that in hand, he was able to figure out that no, you won't disappear. But in order for that to be true, you have to dispel the equations of Newton as providing the absolute most accurate description of nature. Okay, thanks. So uh, here's another question. This is from Aditya S. Pawar. He asks, if we transfer a particle into hyperbolic space, then how is its trajectory or world line affected by the negative curvature of the hyperbolic space? So that's not, uh, that's not something that I actually talk about. Uh, well, I did talk about it in a sense. If you, if you look very carefully at my slides, and maybe you did, you'll notice I talked about Lorentz transformations, but in terms of hyperbolic tree functions. I can bring that slide back up, uh, perhaps. Maybe that would be useful for us. Let me get it back uh, on the share screen, uh, Nathan. Mm -hmm. My computer's a little bit slow, you have to forgive it. It's an old machine. Okay, so I hope that everyone is seeing uh, a set of a matrix equation. And you can see, as you can see, uh, it's the hyperbolic cos uh, cosine and sine that are entered in this. So this is motion along the Z direction by a speed of capital V. These are nothing but Lorentz transformations and um, so how do I say, there's not, in the sense of general relativity, this is not a curved space. That's probably the simplest thing for me to tell you. It may look curved from some particular points of view, but it's not curved in the sense that if you calculate the Riemann curvature tensor associated with the Minkowski space metric, you still get zero. So it's not curved technically, and therefore has no impact on gravity. Okay, thanks. So here are some questions about string theory. So one question is, 
how does the bosonic string theory lead to 26 dimensions? Ah, okay. So I talked about the fact that I created this um, uh, series called Super String Theory, the DNA of Reality. It's a video series. It's available online from the great courses. And this issue of tw how 26 dimensions is something I actually treat there. So let me tell you that story. <clears throat> it turns out that if you look at the bosonic string, which is what the first generation of strings, and you look at the wigglers, remember I introduced you to this notion of wigglers? It turns out that this notion exists for the, exists for the bosonic string. And so in particular, for the bosonic string, one of the wigglers you can ask, does it obey Einstein's equation uh, that generalizes equals MC squared? And what you find is it does, but only if the mass squared is negative. A mass square being negative is the sign of a sick theory. And this is in fact why the bosonic string died or at least went into deep hibernation uh, several decades ago. So uh, that the presence of the wiggler with this, with this negative square mass, meaning it's a tachyon, it was the death of the first uh, bosonic string. And as I said, for someone asking the question, you can see this story told in much more detail in this lecture, video lecture series that I produced uh, in 2006. Okay, very good. I forgot to add, that was asked by Abhijit Ghosh. So there's another string theory related question by Victor Araujo. He asks, how does string theory see the wave particle duality? So if you start asking about the wave particle duality, it means you're thinking quantum mechanically uh, from the very beginning. And in some sense, strings are very clever because uh, string theory, string theory uh, sort of avoid, well, the simplest sorts of strings you can construct are the ones that are associated with Minkowski spaces or, or uh, in fact, they, they don't even, uh, strings don't even, how to say, strings have difficulty uh, uh, accommodating spaces where we have to consider uh, cosmological values. Uh, anti consider they're very happy with, they're very happy with zero, but uh, they're difficult. So, um, in order, if you if you ask how string theory accommodates particle wave duality, it means that you have started off by saying I'm going to be interested in quantum, the quantum version of these theories, not the classical version. And certainly, people like John Schwartz, who I hope is listening today, uh, and the first and uh, Pierre Ramon might be somewhere out there. Uh, these were people working back on string theories back in those days. Um, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the um, way that the, the strings work, when you apply quantum theory, what you find is that Lorentz transformations get what's called an anomaly. And what that means is that Lorentz transformations in the quantum mechanical sense don't work in the same way they do if you didn't quantize the theory. And the only way to avoid that is that uh, at, to, is to um, is to imagine that the string exists in one temporal and twenty-five spatial dimensions. Very good. So um, now there's some questions about the adinkras. So actually, I had the question: What is the origin of the word adinkras? Do you know? Yes, I do. So let me tell you the story about that, Nathan. Thank you for asking. So as I said. When we first started to think about graphs as a way of studying supersymmetry, it was done in a paper that I wrote with, my, with uh, Michael Fox. Let me, let me put that image back up uh, you know, on the screen uh, while I'm talking about it, if I can get my computer to, to cooperate. Give me a second here, then I'll tell you the story. Can I share the screen still, Nathan? Yes, yes, you should be able to. Thank you. Okay, I hope everyone can see that pyramid picture that I used. So back in um, in two o four, or two, I'm sorry, yeah, two o four, I was in um, Georgia, but not the not the state of Georgia, but the country of Georgia. I was uh, several hundred miles north of the border with uh, Iran. And I was visiting some uh, physicists that I knew there because I'd been there previously. And my habit you know, uh, to, to this very day 
is the first thing I do in the morning is look at, is look at the archive. And so I logged on, I looked at the archive and there was this paper by Michael Fox and one of his collaborators. And it was about quantum mechanics and supersymmetry. And in the paper, they had some things that looked a lot like a set of matrices that I had been studying with uh, one of my graduate students. Her name is Lubna Rana, who I also hope is actually out there listening. But Lubna and I had noticed that in, quant in supersymmetric quantum uh, mechanical theories, there's this very peculiar set of matrices that keep recurring over and over in different guises. And so we got very suspicious about these matrices and Michael's results reminded me of these matrices. So I sent an email message to Michael. Uh, as I said, I was in, uh, I was in um, Georgia when I sent my first message. He was actually in the Czech Republic. Uh, we started sending questions back and forth. And then after six weeks of question and answer, we had a research paper, which explained why these strange matrices uh, that I had found are related to graphs. In fact, what they are in graph theory, if you know what a, an adjacency graph uh, is, these matrices are, are modified adjacency graphs. So by the time we finished this paper, I was actually in West Africa in the country of Mali. And we had this paper and we, can, we thought that this might be something very interesting, these graphs as a way of studying supersymmetry and that they might provide ways to obtain knowledge about supersymmetry that we couldn't obtain easily by other methods. So we finished the paper and we said, you know, we ought to name these things. And so we went through a, a various sort of names. And then Michael, who had stepped on the African continent, uh, by the way, he was a European American, he's not an African American, uh, but Michael, who had been, was much more familiar with uh, uh, West African uh, artifacts and artwork than I was, came up with the idea that we ought to call these graphs adinkras. So the word adinkra is actually, I tell people we, are, we acted like typical colonialists and we simply took the word. Uh, adinkras are actually a kind of uh, symbolic, in fact, that cover I showed you, let me see if I can find that cover. That image you see on the cover is a traditional West African adinkra. And so it's a, set, it's a set of symbols that mean something. They have a hidden meaning. And so, like I said, our graphs mean something. So we just took the word. Very good. <laughs> There's another question related to Adinkras. He says, some binary net, so this is from Alexander Kassidis. He says, some binary networks are possible, can be described by random matrix models. Will it be possible to describe the Adinkras networks by some random matrix model? You know, that's a, I, look, I have to tell you, I have no idea. That's a great question. We, those of us who, are, who know about these things have never tried that. And I would challenge the questioner to try, talk to me, try, you know, talk to me, talk to others of us. Maybe it can be done. Uh, and now he has a follow-up question. He says, what is the notion of compactifications to 10 or 9 or 8 dimensions for these 11 uh, dimensional adinkras? That's a, that's a great question. Adinkras kind of don't know about dimensions. They're kind of trans-dimensional. And by that I mean, let me give you a concrete example of that. If you take the adinkra that we have found as the simplest way to have supersymmetry consistent with uh, off-shell uh, off supersymmetry in quantum mechanics in 11 dimensions, that adinkra, we are studying it in the context of 11 dimensions, but compactification on adinkras don't really care about compactification. So that means that we are also simultaneously studying um, N equal H supergravity in four dimensions. Uh, the way, when I say they don't care, by, by that I mean, remember the way I constructed adinkras, I started from a field theory, and then I claim that I have a projection technique that allows me to get to a graph. And so let me, uh, well, your, the question, let me take two specific examples. If I take a what's called a vector multiplet in six dimensions, that's something that's well known in supersymmetry. I can apply my projection technique to it and find its graphical representation. I could start in four dimensions with the n equal two vector multiplet and again apply my projection technique and get a, the graph associated with. Both of those two graphs are the same. So the dinkers don't really care about what number of dimensions you're in. Very good. 
So now there's a question by Tommy Chin, and I think it's related to your share screen of the Feynman diagram. He asks, how does simultaneity work in Feynman diagrams? So <laughs> in some sense, it doesn't. Uh, uh, Feynman diagrams can, how can I say this? Feynman diagrams can be viewed with the time axis in different directions. Uh, you know, we have ST and U particle exchanges, and one of those is actually S, but viewed with time running differently. And so um, simultaneity is not a well-defined concept uh, using Feynman diagrams because it's relativistic and simultaneity is not consistent, is not a well-defined quantity in anything that's relativistic. Okay, I have another question, which is a question about speaking to the let to general public. So fermions, um, I guess, distinguish from bosons in that they anti-commute. Have you tried to explain this concept to the general public? Do you have a good way of doing this? Uh, I've made it. I don't know who's asking the question. I've made this attempt. And um, again, in this uh, video lecture series that I presented in 205, Super String Theory, the DNA of Reality, my best attempt is in there. So uh, I'd have to, I actually don't remember exactly what I did. But it was important that I do so because I wanted to have my uh, viewership understand the difference between uh, bosons and fermions and then use that to describe, uh, I'm sorry, use the geometrical idea of anti-commuting numbers to say, well, aha, these are functions, uh, anti-commuting functions as opposed to ordinary functions. So I don't know if my attempt was good enough or not, but I'm happy to talk to anybody who will look at it and we can see what, what you come up with. Okay. So there's another question about general public by Brito Silva. He says, how can we bring the general public closer to complex subjects such as quantum mechanics and other scientific topics? And he says, what do you think explains the current gap between science and society? It's actually a very interesting question. I was sort of thinking about that earlier this morning because um, if you look at what science did in the 19th century, it fully made itself its impact on countries and cultures around the world. Uh, the scientific advances, creating new products, creating uh, better standards of uh, health were enormous uh, in the 19th century if you look at from the beginning to the end. And so coming out of the 19th century, I think humanity gained an appreciation of what science could do uh, for people. I like to say science is humanity's survival instinct because uh, if we're gonna face challenges like climate change or rogue uh, asteroids or, or Lord forbid, <laughs> the invasion of the zombies, <laughs> right? I mean, that last one's not serious clearly. But if we're gonna be threatened, we're probably gonna have to use our technology to, to, to get to a, a better level of protection. We've actually seen it in the last year with the COVID uh, pandemic. It's our technology that led to the rapid development of the vaccines. And so one of the puzzle, one of the things that I, I guess I find really disturbing is at least in my country, we see lots and lots of evidence that our public doesn't have the same level of trust with regard to scientists and, and science. Uh, you can only, you only need to look at what's happened, for example, with Dr. Fauci, who led uh, our efforts here. Um, it's an extraordinarily disturbing trend. And partly, uh, I tell scientists that we've got to stop looking at the public and saying it's their fault. What can we do is uh, the more important thing. In this talk, I've tried to give an example, namely, where people like you and me, Nathan, we make our living by studying equations, studying the in-depth mathematical properties of equations. And one of the things about the way we use equations is we use them to tell stories. And this is actually what novelists and writers do. They use words, paragraphs, sentences, punctuation to tell stories. So, you know, you could, you, you could ask, well, you know, I'm sure that, that many, maybe 100, 200 years ago, there were people asking, what good is writing? Right? What good is it to learn to write? And the answer is, uh, well, 
we can tell stories. Well, something like that we scientists have got to master. We have got to master how to tell our stories free of the jargon that we use. I mean, the jargon is for our precision to make sure we're accurate and right. But if we're talking to the public, our jargon is actually an impediment. In this talk, you will notice there was almost no mathematics. Yet the bulk of the conceptual uh, output of this talk was extraordinarily mathematical. This is an example, I think, of something that we as scientists must master. And this is, by the way, one of the things that in the APS, you mentioned uh, at the introduction on the president of the APS, this is one thing we're talking about with colleagues about how can we do this more effectively? How, what is it that we need to do differently in order to allow the public to have a closer uh, set of uh, understandings about what we do and hopefully a better, uh, a better uh, level of confidence? Um, so this is just my question. I mean, do you think there's a correlation between growth of social media and this gap between science and society, or is it completely independent? No, no, they're intimately related because the gap is not just between science and society. It's really a gap around the value and existence of expertise. And that's what the social media has actually broken down for many, many of our fellow citizens. Um, the way that I like to think about it is um, the public, well, let me put it this way. Uh, if you watch an athlete like say Simone Biles, almost no one in the public will say, oh, I can do what she can do because no one can actually do it, right? I mean, there are very few athletes who can do what she can do. But when you look at something like say, thinking about the way space and time works, many people in the public will tell you, oh, I can do that too. And they can talk to each other because of social media. They can build up uh, masses of, of uh, collections of people who agree with one view or another. And then as a person who's not scientifically literate, you look at what the scientists say, well, that's a mass of people saying one thing. And then you look at this mass of other people and they're saying something different. And if you're not scientifically literate, how do you choose? So yeah, social media is an enormous driver in the, in the diminishing regard that expertise writ large has. The scientific expertise is only part of that. Mm -hmm. So there's a related question by Yvesun Braga. So he's asking if it's even possible for the general public, for the lay population to understand scientific language. I mean, is it something so let me take, so let me use another story. Uh, there was once two store owners, and they had stores uh, side by side. And one of them uh, noticed that his competitor had all the customers uh, going to his store and a few going uh, to the other store, but not to his. Does he blame the customers? And so the reason I tell that story is I challenge the scientific community to stop blaming the public for the lack of our effectiveness in, it, in communication. That's actually our problem. We need to deal with it. We need to apply the same level of commitment, tenacity, intelligence that we apply to the doing of our science to this issue of being effective communications. And you know, the question was even phrased in a way that I find uh, is probably off-putting, the scientific language. But what we need is an effective language. Okay, let me ask a different kind of question, which again is from me. So APS has these minority programs um, and there are of course similar problems in other countries. Brazil has a similar problem. Have any of these been successfully used in other cultures that you know of? Are you aware of, of any other societies using APS methods? Not across the ethnic divides that we're looking at now. However, one, there's this very one interesting example I know about that sort of is sort of uh, like this. And this is the problem that Peter the Great faced in modernizing uh, Russia. Because that's actually, uh, that also sort of il illustrates the same. See, people often think that 
ethnicity and culture are intimately wedded to each other, but they're not. Uh, culture and ethnicity, ethnicity typ typically has its basis in biology. Culture has its basis in sociology. So the two are not necessarily wedded to each other. So if you stop and think about what Peter the Great faced in modernizing uh, Russia and look at what actually happened, it looks curiously like the sorts of things we talk about diversity now. In his case, uh, it was uh, bringing in a, a greater opportunity for people of the Russian empire to interact with people in Western Europe and to actually bring people from Western Europe to Russia and specifically to the educational system to teach uh, Russian citizens. And so that's the only example I know where I think it was successful and it's not a perfect match, but that's the closest I know about. Okay, thanks. So we have another question coming back to string theory. So um, the question is by Abhijit Ghosh. So he wants to know how does string theory bridge the inconsistencies between quantum physics and, and gravity? So thank you for the question. I am going to refer to something that seems to be almost unknown to people outside the string community. In 1980, a physicist by the name of Dan Ferdan showed something rather remarkable. And as I said, I, I almost never hear comment about that. Uh, I was a young assistant pro, uh, professor uh, starting in 82 at MIT, and I remember studying Dan's work. And what Dan showed was that if Einstein had never lived, but that if we had been able to develop quantum mechanics, someone would have derived the Einstein equations of motion. And so this is done in the context of what are called nonlinear sigma models. And in particular, there's something called the beta function that you calculate in that context. And you don't have to know anything about general relativity to derive Einstein's field equations if you know how to do relativistic quantum field theory. That shows sort of the power of quantum theory by itself, that it can actually reach out. There's a pathway for deriving general relativity solely starting from quantum theory. So how does it bridge it? Well, this thing that I described, this work by Dan for Dan, is actually a string theory. Uh, it wasn't particularly recognized at the time. And maybe that's why people don't talk about it so much. But I advise, if you're a physicist, go look for uh, Dan's papers in 1980. And then you'll see, you'll see a particular example of how quantum mechanics quantum theory resolves the conflict because it actually reaches out and grabs general relativity. Okay. Um, so let me ask a related question about supersymmetry. So do you think supersymmetry is also necessary for bridging this inconsistency between quantum physics and gravity or is string theory enough? Well, I'm hesitating because I often tell people string theory doesn't actually exist. And what I mean by that is that string theory is, is a framework. It's, it's, and the other part of it is that it's not like other parts of accepted physics. So when some people, when someone asks me about string theory, my real question is what part of it are you talking about? And since in this question, it wasn't made clear, I don't know how to answer the question. But I, I, I was asking about supersymmetry. Do you think supersymmetry is crucial for bridging? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was emphasizing, and I was focused on the string theory part of it. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, Nathan, I do. But for reasons that are far removed from things, again, I, things that, uh, that I see generally discussed. I, I'm kind of a refuse nature in some sense, if people know what that term means. Uh, a lot of things that are except as conventional wisdom don't make a lot of sense to me. And that's why, for example, in 2006, when most of my colleagues were saying the LHC would probably find supersymmetry, I said, no, I don't think so. So why do I think supersymmetry is important? Well, it has nothing, well, to me, the most urgent uh, need for supersymmetry is indicated around questions of the stability of the quantum vacuum. And by that, I mean, um, in particular, 
if you look at particle physics and look at the mass of the top quark versus the Higgs, there are some calculations in phenomenology that says that we are very close to a metastable line in terms of the stability of the standard model. And this metastable, metastable line marks the, uh, the difference between the kinds of models that we work with and the possible emergence of the, um, of the decay of the false vacuum. And so if we're so close to that line, you would probably want some kind of mechanism in your field theory that suppress probabilities of tunneling into the, fall, into the true vacuum. And supersymmetry is the only thing I know about that seems to have that property. That's why I think it's important. Okay. Very good. Okay, so we're running out of time now. So um, what I want to do is, I, of course, uh, want to invite you all to, to come tomorrow. So we have a, an, a similar outreach activity tomorrow at the same time, 2 p.m. in Brazil, uh, with David Gross as the moderator. We have a panel of four journalists, including our own uh, Jandir Oliveira. And uh, we, we also, of course, are going to ask questions to the speakers from the strings meeting. So we invite you all to participate either again in English or Portuguese on the two YouTube channels. So they're all advertised on our webpage. So I want to thank, of course, uh, Anna Luisa and Malena who have been helping us with the, with the translations. And I want to give, of course, a great thank you to, to Jim Gates for, for being uh, able to give this, this wonderful uh, public lecture. So thanks very much. And I hope to see you all tomorrow at a similar time. Bye-bye.